Hey, Angel Donovan with Dating Skills Podcast. Today, we're taking a different perspective on the whole dating, sex, and relationships marketplace. And marketplace is the right word. We're talking about sexual marketplace supply and demand and looking from a research perspective, so economics and evolutionary psychology and these types of research on how to approach dating, sex, and relationships in a strategic manner to get the most out of it based on our resources, based on our qualities, and based on our strengths and weaknesses, and what the supply and demand looks like there. So it's a smarter way of approaching the whole thing, and we're going to be talking about hooking up, which is the difference between starting a relationship and then having sex, which is kind of like the old way, and it's pretty much de facto standard today where people are hooking up first, so you hook up, you have sex, or you start sexual relationships before you get into a relationship. In a general manner, that's pretty much the de facto standard of what people do today. So we're focusing a bit more on hooking up and also on college and university. So if you're right now at college and university, you want to know how that works and how to approach it the best way. This is going to be a great episode for that. And also, if you didn't do so well in college and university, you may learn why. And it may be pretty interesting for you from that perspective. So today's guest is Susan Walsh. She's an ex-strategy consultant and a Wharton MBA. If you don't know, Wharton is one of the best schools in the world, business schools in the world. Susan left that life in 2008 when she started a blog on dating, sex and relationships, which has over time built up a very active community. So what I like about this is that she's very focused on the strategy perspective, which is different. And also she has a lot of people who are very active on her blog. So she's really kind of in touch with demand, (laughs) what people actually want what their top concerns are on the problems they have. So she's got a perspective on that that she's going to be bringing to this episode, which is really useful. So you can learn more about what are the top concerns of women and other guys your age, for example. To give you an idea of what her blog's about, one of the first posts she ever wrote was entitled, Sex is Strategic, So Should You Be. To get all the usual stuff, the MP3 download, the interview transcript, and the show notes with all the links to anything we mention on the show, go to datingskillsreview.com forward slash podcast. To get all of that in your email inbox, go to datingskillsreview.com forward slash newsletter, and you can get it all there automatically. Now let's get into this interview. I'm Angel Donovan, and this is the Dating Skills Podcast. This is a 14-year ongoing mission to discover the truth about what works in dating, sex, and relationships, to become a better man. Join me as I leave no stone unturned, chase down every expert, role model, and mentor with insights to get us to that goal as fast as possible. This show is about bringing you the best of that information so that you can take it in and change your life for the better, step by step, episode by episode. Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having to me. To get started, I'd like to just learn a little bit about you, where you are at in life, what stage, where you live, how old you are, these kind of little details to give us a bit of background on where you are. Okay. Well, I'm probably unusual in this industry in that senior citizen compared to a lot of dating coaches. I'm 58 years old. You don't look it, by the way, at all. Thank you. <laughs> Well, that's so nice to hear because some of my detractors like to talk about how ancient I am and how long ago I hit the wall. (laughs) It's okay because, as I said, I've been married 30 years. I met my husband when I was 25. And um, so cruel. So we've been together well over 30 years at this point. I live in the Boston area. I have two grown children. Um, I have a son who's 28 and a daughter who's 25. And I started the blog seven and a half years ago. And the way it started was my daughter and her friends were like seniors in high school and they were starting, you know, to go out and hang out with guys. And they kept coming back. Well, she kept coming to me, my own daughter did, and saying, there's this guy, he asked me to this or he wants to do this, but he's telling me up front, I just want to hook up. I'm not interested. I don't want a girlfriend. So she had a group of about eight or 10 friends. And it turned out that every one of these girls at various levels of confidence and attractiveness, but they all were getting some, some play, some guys showing some interest. Every one of these guys said, I really just want to hook up. I'm not interested in a relationship. And they were saying like, this sucks. I'm a senior in high school. I want to go to a prom with my boyfriend and there are no boyfriends. 
So I started talking to them and they felt like they were under a lot of pressure to put out. And there was really, it was that or stay home on a Friday night kind of a thing. And so I was really uh, sort of strategic with them as opposed to judgmental. And you and I talked briefly already about having both been strategy consultants. And so I would say, well, let's take a look at what the situation is and what is the marketplace? What's the environment you're dealing with? And what are kind of what are the rules of the marketplace? So I began to encourage them rather than doing something that felt completely inauthentic and made them really upset afterwards to, okay, maybe this means you're going to be on the sidelines, but here's how you can live with yourself. And here's how you might identify the guy who's just saying that, but really would like a girlfriend or maybe some guys who you're not even talking to who would like a girlfriend. So it became this kitchen table thing where I would have 12 of these girls coming over, really wanting to pick my brain. All of them saying, I couldn't possibly talk to my mom about this because they were saying to me, I hooked up with him. I did this for him. And then he didn't call. And they couldn't say that to their own moms. And I would also, the thing that really I think made it work is that I would tell them my own missteps because I went to college in the late seventies and we had relationships and we had casual things, but the casual thing didn't lead to a relationship. So you might have a boyfriend you broke up with him, then you might have a one night stand, but it was highly unlikely that you would even know the person's name, much less exchange numbers. So there was no question of, is he going to call me? This is like looking for Mr. Goodbar era. And so that was all very anonymous. The Mr. And Goodbar? Sorry? Have you ever heard of that book? There was a book and then a movie made. I think Richard Gere starred in it. And it was called Looking for Mr. Goodbar. And it was based on a true story of a woman who went into a bar and found a guy and went home with him and he killed her. Nice. So this, okay. <laughs> so it's kind of grim, but that was the time we were taking, you know, big risks when we did that because we really would meet people. It will people still do it today, obviously. Right. Back then it was very normal though. It seemed I wasn't around in the 70s, but my understanding of that era, it was like the most free era in terms of people just first opening up to this kind of thing. So maybe being more naive about it than maybe people are free today, but they're less naive about it. I think that's exactly right. The 70s was really the frontier and people were experimenting. And one of the things that gets discussed so much on my blog is, well, what's your number? How many people have you had sex with? And my kids' generation, your generation, has mostly tracked this pretty carefully. Most guys and girls can tell you exactly how many people they've had sex with. And when people get together, maybe for something more serious or relationship, they often have a conversation where they want to know this information from each other. Well, we didn't keep track. I don't know my number. I don't know my husband's number. It's not all that high. And I don't think his is all that high, but I actually don't know. And to be honest, I, I don't care that much. So I think that's really changed too. We were kind of doing this stuff, but it did feel a little bit forbidden. And so it wasn't something you boasted about. I'm sure guys boasted about it, but it was just more on the down low than it is now. And we were naive. So it was, we were kind of figuring it out as we went along. Anyway, so I got these girls and they really got into telling me all this stuff. And I was fascinated by what I was hearing and what the dynamics were among these 18 year olds. And they all went off to college ultimately. And um, I thought I'm going to start a little blog so we could, they were all over the place, all over the U.S., so I'm going to start a little blog so we can keep in touch. And then, of course, I realized after a couple of weeks, I saw on Google, well, you had 50 visitors to your blog today. And I thought, 50? There are only 10 of us. How can that be? I was so naive. I didn't even understand how Google search would bring people to my little blog. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, then I began to look at the Google search terms and people were treating Google as a sentient being. He told me he really liked me. He promised he would call me again if we had sex. We had sex. He didn't call. What should I do? This would be a search term that would bring someone to my blog. And I'm sure you've seen the same thing at your website. So it, it grew from there. And so I became kind of the auntie, this wiser, older woman who wasn't really a prude as a young person who could sort of help these women how to navigate. And then in time, my readership is now actually half male. So... A lot of guys online, as you well know, looking for stuff about dating skills, and some of them wind up at my blog as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Your blog is hookingupsmart.com, mm -hmm. and you've got quite a large following, you can just see from the comments. You get a lot of activity on that blog, and so I'm sure you have a lot of readers. Yeah. There. So it's good that you can have both, because there's not all of the spheres on the internet these days. You, know, you have both women and men talking together about these subjects. It's just nice to have them a, give them a place where they can both talk about it. We're focused on men, of course. 
Yes. But because you're looking at both of this and you've been doing both sexes and you've been doing this for a long time, I was wondering what you feel are the top concerns from each party where it comes to hooking up. What are the most popular questions or the most intense questions that people come up with? All right. So top concerns of men and women. So what I was going to say is uh, my orientation tends to come at this from kids going off to college. And that's when most of them are really starting to think about having sex and wanting relationships and wanting to interact with the opposite sex. So hookup culture, as you can tell by the name of my blog, is kind of my area of interest. And what's happened... I know you have a definition of that. It's a word we use all the time, hookup. But uh, what does it actually mean? I know you have definitions and stuff. So could you briefly tell us what it means? So... So hooking up, people often assume it just means having sex, and it doesn't. The term hooking up, at least as used in the U.S., can refer to a makeout. And in fact, a lot of hookups are dance floor makeouts, or we made out at the bar. And that's since they mean less, maybe expectations are lower after something like that. But when researchers try to figure out how much hooking up college students are doing, it's important to understand that they're including who did you kiss? How many different guys did you kiss this year? Or, and then some percentage of those will have ended in sexual intercourse, of course, but it's a much wider net they're casting. And I think there's a deliberate vagueness to it so that the guy could say we hooked up and his friends may not be exactly. She has a lot of implication that goes on. A woman might say, well, we hooked up, but it was not a big deal. I've heard kids say to each other, well, did you hook up? Hook up. <laughs> so, <laughs> to which kind of implies, did you have sex? Or did you get there? So did you hook up? Hook up is really, really hooking up. Hook up, usually when I've heard women say like, oh, I heard you guys hooked up last night. It usually refers to making out. Usually not much more. The first time. Yeah. And then the other important thing I would say about hookup culture People get really caught up in this vocabulary and it's problematic. They'll say, there's no such thing as hookup culture. We have studies and all reams of data that show that only 15% of college students hook up more than twice a year. Hookup culture is not, in my mind, what how people are behaving. It's the messages that we're receiving and what we believe the norm is. So one of the things that researchers talk a lot about is pluralistic ignorance. So if you go to a college campus and you ask the guys, the college guys, what percentage of the guys on this campus do you think had sex this past weekend? They generally answer 75 to 80% on average. The guys believe that 75 to 80% of the guys on campus had sex that weekend. The real number is somewhere between five and 15%. That's, it'd be interesting to see who's answering the questions like that. So uh, just because you pulled out quite a big term out, Pluralistic ignorance, what does that mean for people? It means that we accept something as normal behavior because we believe the majority is doing it happily. And so if we're not doing it, we feel like an outlier. So what I've come to believe very strongly is that a large number of students who aren't behaving this way, either because they don't have the opportunity or they don't want to, feel like total losers, especially the guys who are under a special kind of pressure to get that to get the hookup. And so, so many guys feel really like they're not making the grade. And, but in reality, you know, you could say misery loves company, but I think it would be helpful if they understood that most of us are in the same boat here, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try to get better with women and we shouldn't try to learn how to interact socially in a way that feels more comfortable. But it saddens me that these college boys, these are 18 to 20 year old male, 18 to 21 year old males, are saying, I'm behind. I'm behind my age group. I haven't lost my virginity. And the truth is that even senior year of college in the U.S., 21 years old, about a quarter of men and women are virgins. And the numbers track pretty similarly through all four years. So it's not a disproportionate number of men are getting nothing and most women are having a lot of casual sex. I believed that for a while, and I really began to explore what are the dynamics and try to drill down and pick apart who's doing what and where are these activities concentrated. And the story is complex. So we have a culture where people believe a certain thing, but the reality is really quite different. I'm just interested in what you might think of, have you read the book, What Women Want? Uh, Daniel Bergner, uh, which reviews... I have not read the book. I have read quite a bit about it. So he talks about that we're not a monogamous species, for example. Well, I think the main takeaway, I'm actually in the middle of reading it. I've been meaning to read it for a while. But one of the things just in this context, which might be relevant, is when women are answering surveys about their sexuality, they're a lot more inhibited than men 
so when they're comparing it to physiological information, where they're doing these experiments with physiology, so measuring how wet the vagina is, measuring erections, these fun, so they can actually see the responses and things like this. They found that women are estimating their numbers about 70% lower than, in this context, I'm saying, well, potentially the number of virgins in a year is lower than 25%, but maybe that's about right for guys. I don't know, based on that work. Well, that's interesting because, and again, keeping in mind that I have focused pretty much on the college age group in my research, I got, there was so much debate about this on my site, and it's got to be such a huge issue. I wrote this post, the definitive survey of college sexual behavior, and it really refers to about 20 different studies. It's really kind of a survey of everything we know that's out there. And I do address the question of people fudging the numbers. And there's no question that women minimize their sexual experience and men exaggerate their sexual experience. One study found that men actually exaggerate a little bit more than women play theirs down, but it's not very clear cut. I'm sure you've heard of the study, the lie detector study, where they women gave a certain number, their, a number of sexual partners they had and they said a certain thing and then they were asked again and told that they were now attached to a lie detector and the number yeah, went yeah. However, what's never mentioned by people who are really interested in sort of pimping that study is that the number went up by less than one partner and was found to be statistically insignificant. So the woman said, I had three partners, when in reality, on average, she'd had 3.6 partners or 3.7 partners. So I think 70%, I would question that, certainly among young people, in part because they're less sexually experienced, and they're not talking about having had 20 partners at the age of 19, no matter what their view of sexuality is. So I think that both sexes are not entirely honest in those situations, even when anonymity is guaranteed. But I do find that the responses, the kinds of responses, the numbers, the percentages are about the same for girls and guys across dozens and dozens of studies. So you get about the same percentage of guys and girls saying, I think casual sex is great, I enjoy it, I don't regret it, that's what I'm looking for, versus I would really like to be in a relationship. They've asked guys at college, college kid guys, do you want to be in a relationship? 75% would prefer it. Now, I know that from a lot of the conversations I'd had, you'd say, well, maybe some of those guys know I'm never going to be a player. So maybe my best strategy is like to get a girlfriend and have a girlfriend in college. And there's no question that getting sexual access is one incentive to making a commitment, right? So that goes on too. The other thing I would say about blood flow to the vagina and all of that during these studies, I think there's no question, it's been really clearly demonstrated that female sexuality is more fluid. So we are much more able to more likely to be bisexual, for example, really bisexual. Like I dig women and I dig men. Because I think men when I hear that a male is bisexual, I often think, well, he's probably gay. I think female sexuality is more fluid. Women get turned on watching animals mate. We can get turned on by a lot of different things. Uh, and female arousal is different that way. And I think Bergner does go into that in his book. The other thing that I've read, and I actually don't know if this is true, I've read that women become lubricated in response to sexual stimuli and it's a protective mechanism because if they anticipate that they're going to be penetrated, injury is minimized by that. So that's it's so funny. I was I was talking to one of my partners today about this study and saying that it was probably due to that also. Yeah. So I think that 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 makes sense to me. It's no question that women have rape fantasies and women get into Fifty Shades of Grey and whatever. But then then it's important to keep in mind that these are not fantasies that most women want to enact in real life, right? The fantasy, the whole idea of the fantasy is that it's safe. And I don't know if men would be more inclined to actually act out their fantasies if they had the opportunity. I suspect they would. But the fact that a woman is fantasizing about a very sexually dominant, perhaps even violent man taking her, ravishing her for sex, in my view, does not translate into that's how a woman wants to be approached or even seduced by a man in real life. Because there's a safety, there's a safety issue for women always. Right, right, absolutely. So we're kind of skipping around. Uh, so there's a couple of concerns you brought up there. So guys, obviously, they feel pressure to have slept with women, not not be virgins when they're at college. Is that one of the main issues that's coming up? Yes, and they feel like they, the other thing is that guys really feel like they don't have the social skills to be comfortable and confident with women. 
And I've done a lot of reading and research about this too. There's no question, I'm sure you're aware that 60% of college students in the U.S. are female, only 40% of male. That number is going down. The number of men in college, the percentage continues. Right, so it's getting worse, yeah, the imbalance. Yeah. We are in a period where young males are not thriving or certainly not thriving as much as they used to. I do believe this has to do with the women's movement and men's role in society has been really um, tumbled. It's been very uncertain. The recession has hit male-dominated professions harder. Any kind of labor-oriented job or manufacturing, those jobs are going away as technology becomes a larger and larger part of the economy. So there are a lot of reasons that males are not thriving. Uh, by the way, I, there's also a lot of uh, bias against boys in school, in elementary school. Teachers are much more likely to appreciate girl energy than boy energy, if you know what I mean. So I think this was of separating boys from girls when they're young. And as they get older, it just feels like there's less opportunity for boys. And I think they get kind of stymied and they feel confused about what their role is. I've witnessed and ha hosted on my blog many, many debates about what the definition of masculinity is. It's in flux for sure. For sure. So we have the greatest generation in World War II had a very certain kind of notion of what masculinity was. And that clearly does not apply today. So I do think men are kind of trying to figure that out. And that takes a long time. And one of the consequences of all of these developments to young men is that they have become less comfortable with women. They've had to become more competitive with women in a different way than they ever were before. And as women have gained traction, they're in no way obligated to search for a provider. So it gives women more options in the sense that they don't have to have a child. They don't have to get married. Now, most women do, of course, want to fall in love and have a life partner and have that experience. But it's not a necessity. 200 years ago, a woman would have to marry or, I don't know, be a governess or something to make her way. She, she just absolutely couldn't do anything else. And now, of course, the fact that you have women having a lot more choices. And we see this new book by Kate Bolick called Spinster. Here are women saying, I celebrate the single life and this is what I want to do. And some percentage of women, not the majority, but even if it's 10%, that's a pretty big shift in female incentives and female choices. So that's another thing that's happening. And that makes it harder for guys to get access. Absolutely, absolutely. There's some interesting trends there. In terms of the girls and what their top concerns are with men, so we're talking primarily about college, I'm guessing. Your readership is primarily focused on college? Well, I would say that the readership probably goes through the 20s, but I do not have, I, every so often I'll have a woman in her 30s come by, but that's a whole different marketplace, as I'm sure you know. Women in their 30s are having a very different kind of experience than women, say, 18 to 28. I would say that's my readership, yes. 18 to 28. Great, great. Yeah, it's good to be targeted. So what do you think their top concerns, you feel their top concerns are, the women in that age range? I think that it has to do mostly around sex. So one of the things I hear about the most and I get emailed about the most is they want to have this talk, the talk, where they define the relationship before they have sex. Or they don't want to have sex without having any idea, does this guy like me? Is this guy having mm -hmm. sex with other people? So they want to know I'm headed toward boyfriend-girlfriend territory. I think most of them know that if they say, I only have sex with boyfriends, most guys are going to disappear. It ties into the whole pluralistic ignorance thing, too, because then the guy thinks, well, she's really an outlier. Uh, and I don't have to deal with that because most women are not going to feel that way. I have to admit, I was a bit surprised when you said that when you were talking about your daughter and her, her friends, that a lot of them were getting told by the guys that the guys only wanted hookups versus some subtle communication. Because in the guys we're coaching and in our experiences, they find it quite difficult to bring these topics up. The guys are very nervous about bringing up the fact that they're not going to be into relationships for a variety of reasons, which we were actually talking about last night. It's like stuff like, I don't want to hurt her feelings. All sorts of things are going on in their heads. And then, so it's an element of anxiety for them. And when most people feel anxious, they avoid it <laughs> from both sides. So that's what I've seen a lot. So I was just wondering if you continue to see that the guys are telling the girls that they want to hook up or are they being a lot more indirect? And like you're currently saying now is the girls are confused because they don't know what they're getting into and they're not being told. And they're like, oh, I, I want a relationship, but I really can't tell if this guy is relationship or not. Well, those are really good questions. So first I would say, you know, sort of in the context of what my daughter was experiencing, and this was still in high school, 
keep in mind, the guys who are coming forward and saying, I just want to hook up, I don't want a relationship. This is not all guys. This is a self-selected group of guys who are comfortable approaching high school girls and saying, this is what I want. Do you want to hang out? Do you want to hook up? So most of the guys in high school wouldn't dream of saying that or making that demand because they actually would like to be in a relationship. So the guys who are going to come forward and in your face about this is what I want and I'm not willing to settle for like commitment to get it. Those guys, you would call them alpha males, right? So- yeah, I was going to say, they're probably <laughs> the guys at the top of the pyramid because they have more choice. And so they feel like they can communicate. They're more confident about communicating it because they think there's going to be another girl around the corner just to... Like- and these are the guys who, by the way, compete successfully intrasexually. These are the guys who feel like they're at the top of the food chain in their all boys school or whatever. So these are the guys who they may be athletes or they may have developed early physically, they're shaving, they have five o'clock shadow as opposed to the guy who's still got the baby face at age 18. And they probably have a higher sex drive because they've had more exposure to testosterone at that age than some other guys do. But then what happens in college though is very similar. So you're probably familiar with our system of fraternities and sororities and athletes are very coddled creatures on campus. And the social life of schools in the U.S. is probably, I think it is very different in England. If the social life here is largely hosted by these organizations. So the fraternities have a party and all freshman girls are invited. Now, all freshman guys can't get in because the fraternity wants to keep the number of guys quite low and with all the girls are invited. And so these guys now have a very favorable sex ratio. They feel like the big men on campus. They're the ones who have kegs. No one else can get beer at age 18. So they have this advantage and they dictate that the norm is come on up to my room on the third floor and uh, we'll have some time to be quiet together. Now, the research shows very clearly that the most people who go for these hookups are freshman girls. And they, the numbers dwindle very significantly after freshman year and drop off to almost zero after sophomore year. So women are sort of getting wise to having have these hookups that go nowhere and they feel crappy about it. So a lot of times these guys become, they actually put on kind of the beta male act. I'm a really good guy. Their friends may say to the girl, he really likes you. I haven't heard him talk about a girl like this way in a long time. So even if he has a history of being sort of a player or hanging out with, or he's a wannabe player, his friends will be kind of vouching for him. He may wait quite a while before he like puts the moves on really hard and aggressively. And by quite a while, I mean maybe two or three weeks of hanging out. But then once the girl has sex, the next day he sees her on campus, he doesn't know her. So this happens a lot. It happens a lot to girls. They're naive. So in college, the naive, inexperienced girls get seduced by these guys. The naive and experienced males have no idea what to do. And they're anxious and they would never dream of saying to a girl, it's hook up or nothing. They'd love to meet a girl in their English class and have coffee with her and get into a relationship. So again, it's a pretty small percentage of people dictating what the norm is perceived to be. Great, great, great. Thank you for that. Are there any other top concerns we've missed that often come up on your blog between men and the women that you really feel define the times or their top concerns right now? Yeah, the other thing that I would say, and both sexes really feel this, is there's sort of a dominant concept, the principle of least interest. Whoever cares less has the most power. So both guys and girls work pretty hard to come across as the person who cares the least. So they are struggling. And the real problem with this is that who's going to blink first? And it becomes very adversarial. So there's a natural competition between men and women in mating anyway, right? So men would rather have more quantity and variety, but they will are willing to commit under some conditions. Women would rather have commitment in overall, in general, on average, but they will have short-term mating experiences under certain conditions. So there's always a balancing act that has to go on between men and women to meet each other halfway or meet in the middle. With a principle of least interest, you know, it's like two boxers standing in a ring and (laughs) neither one will come off the ropes. Right. There's no question that more women regret casual sex than men do, but a pretty significant percentage of men, like a third of men who have a one-night stand say the next day, I wish I hadn't, actually. It didn't. It actually felt kind of crummy. Right. I can imagine a lot of that's related to alcohol as well. Would that be the case? Yes. Yeah. 
alcohol obviously plays a huge role, as I'm sure you know from all the stuff that's being talked about in the U.S. about sexual assault. Alcohol plays a huge role in sexual assault. And they've also found studies about alcohol use on campus and binge drinking. Both men and women cite the primary reason for getting drunk with friends or pre-gaming before they go to a co-ed social event is to have the balls yeah. to go for the hookup. So guys are getting inebriated so that they can be more uninhibited and more sexually assertive than they would be if they were sober. And women are getting drunk so that they would be less inhibited and more inclined to like, I can do that and I think that might be enjoyable if I'm drunk. There's a pretty high percentage of American college students who have never had sex sober. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty amazing, the current alcohol trend. Basically, how important that's become to hooking up. It's like this excuse that I need to do this. It's interesting. We sometimes advise people to just quit alcohol and it's kind of like, oh my God, like you quit alcohol because then you start getting what you want rather than mistakes. And when you're inebriated, you're not making the same decisions, the right decisions. Also, you're not putting out the best part of yourself, the best version of yourself either. So it's a shame that people need this for confidence, that they feel like they need it for confidence because they're actually dumbing down their personalities and and by the way, the sex isn't that great. Right? Absolutely. I mean, these yeah. are <laughs> two drunk people. I mean, I remember reading something like really low percentage, like 19% of women have orgasm in attempted sexual intercourse or sexual intercourse hookups. And the percentage of men that do is 48%. And I was flabbergasted. 48%? Why is it not 100%? Right. Well, it's because right. what women here call whiskey dick, right? And it's just... Right. They can't function So when they're that inebriated. So these are not even sexually rewarding experiences, even for the guys in many cases. Yeah, and then some guys, they get a problem about it. They get whiskey dick a couple of times, and, and then it becomes a thing for them. It becomes this concern, especially combined with porn usage these days, which is kind of off the charts. We've talked about that before as well. So, yeah, they kind of work all together to not create the great environment. But I understand there's a lot of pressure to drink as well. So it's just... It's really hard. I mean, I think these freshman girls arrive. And like I said, the fraternities are hosting these gatherings and alcohol is a key part of that. And the girls want to be popular. They want to be cool. A lot of them want to find their first boyfriend and they think, great. I'm, and, and the American college experience has really become, this is four years where I'm going to get away from my parents and go crazy. Now, not all kids feel that way, but that's become a pretty important part of the American college experience. And I think this bubble is going to burst. It has to, because now we're having this cold Title IX legislation around sexual assault has come to a head. And people are basically going through college for four years drunk and then graduating with some kind of degree where they didn't do all that well. And they've got a quarter million dollars of student debt. I Absolutely. mean, it's... It's crazy. And so and now technology is going to allow education to be delivered in different ways. I think it's going to take a while to shake out, but I do think we're in the kind of Rome is burning phase of American college kids acting insane and irresponsible to this degree. Yeah. Guys listening to this, uh, please take school seriously <laughs> and, and try to get over the drinking habit because it doesn't help in many ways. Um, so what would you say are the most important strategic decisions guys make today about their sex life? What are the impacts of these decisions? When they're in college, what kinds of decisions are they making? I'm a big proponent of inner game. I'm not so big on what I would call behavioral correlates. I think there's some value of fake it till you make it. And there's some value in approaching a lot of people and getting into conversations. But I think authenticity is key. So if you want to come across as an interesting guy to women, an intelligent guy, a funny guy, a guy with broad interests, you have to become a guy who pursues interests, preferably shareable interests, right? If your interest is video games, it's going to be very hard to maybe monetize that in the sexual marketplace in a way that's beneficial. So I really think that it takes time. If they want to sort of get up and running today, I want to like, my goal is to get better with women right now. Personally, I think that this is a realistic goal for the next six months and maybe that's how you have a girlfriend or go on a series of first dates for a lot of these guys is going to be a better goal than I'm going to start hitting clubs or hitting parties and I'm hopefully going to get laid in the next couple of weeks. And I think and a lot of those guys, that's not authentic to even who they are or what they want. If that's what you want, if you want to learn to be good at casual and you can go get casual, do it. There are women who want that too. I have no problem with that. I'm sort of about people getting, but the people who come to me 
are want relationships, the guys and the girls. He's like, I want a girlfriend. I want to be in love. I want to have the kind of sex that's like we can't get enough of each other for 72 hours. But you have to be able to be authentic and comfortable with who you are. You can't keep up a front for too long. The relationship isn't going to work. So if your goal is a real relationship, a long-term relationship, you're going to have to do the hard work of self-development. And that's a bitter pill to swallow for a lot of guys. They want results soon. And I understand that. And I think there are some short-term things that can happen that are good in that sense, but I think it's a longer timeline. I think people need to get realistic about that. So that's a really important choice. No, so you're basically saying, don't look for the shortcut, the magic bullet, because it's going to take time, especially if you're looking for a relationship. Yes. I mean, Is that a good summary? Yeah. I read the game and Mystery Method, and there's no question that you could have some good success at short-term mating by doing certain things in certain places with certain kinds of people. But the problem is that a lot of the guys who are looking for this kind of advice, that isn't their ultimate goal. They really don't want to be a player. They just want to look like a player long enough to get the girl of their dreams. And that's the reality. That's what a lot of guys really want. At least those are the guys that are coming to me. A lot of them have sort of tried um, more direct or more overt seduction stuff or like hung around Red Pill subreddit and stuff like that. Could you just highlight what this Red Pill subreddit is in case? I'm sure some people don't know. We've referenced Red Pill maybe a couple of times or the Manosphere on the show, but okay. we haven't looked at it properly. So the Red Pill is something that basically it refers to the movie The Matrix, where you can you can take the blue pill and live in a world of self-delusion or you could take the red pill and understand, in this case, the true nature of women. What is the true nature of women? As you can imagine, this gets pretty, um, pretty negative pretty quickly because the men who are discussing this, what is the true nature of women, are men who are also saying, I really need to learn how to feel more comfortable with women or I want to get better with women. And if it's not working, well, then it's very easy to say this is because women are hypergamous or women only want... 10% of the men or whatever it might be. And it becomes very adversarial. Someone just did a statistical analysis of all the Reddit subreddit communities. And the al this algorithm called sentiment analysis searched all of the comments and all of the upvotes and downvotes for traces of bigotry and hatred. And the red pill of 250 subreddits came in number one, most bigoted and hateful. I, people have told me that they, I've been threatened with rape at my age. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I Did you, you feel flattered? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> But people get very upset and it's online and it gets away from them and what have you. So I think that a lot of guys come to me after having sort of found that world and say, that is too toxic for me, but it seems to me like you're talking about some of the same stuff. You're honest about what women want. You're willing to say women like dominant men or whatever. And so I don't have a feminist perspective. I think I see more approachable to guys a lot of times for that reason. But this whole red pill thing has been problematic on my site. And it's really hard because their guys show up and they can say some really, really terrible things to the women who are commenting there. And it's not personal. It's anonymous, but it still is, makes for a bad experience at the blog for the readers. Yeah. I think a lot of those guys are in a bit of a dark place. They've probably been trying for a while. And I think those are the worst ones. They've been trying for a while and they haven't been getting anywhere. After a while, they basically give up and then they turn it on. So they make it someone else's responsibility because they haven't been able to do it, figure it out. Then it becomes someone else's responsibility, the women in this case. So I've seen those communities rise up. There's the Manosphere, the Red Pill. I kind of look at them interchangeably, but I haven't looked at them in detail enough to understand if there's big differences between them. But I do see that there's definitely a lot of dissatisfaction in those communities. So I'm not sure why guys would want to be a part of that dissatisfaction. It's obvious the people in those communities are not happy. So why go there? Whereas many other communities, guys are really happy and they're really satisfied. And I think that's the message on this topic is if you want to be satisfied with your life, go somewhere where other people are satisfied. You're more likely to get it rather than going someplace where there's a lot of people who aren't satisfied and they're bitching about it because those are typically the people who've given up. Exactly. The most popular blogs in this sphere, the manosphere, the red pill sphere, are 
these men who are in a pretty dark place all the time, and that's where they've decided to reside. But they're very popular because there's a sense of community. You know, I think you know, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one feeling this way. Some people at my blog, they say, oh, Susan, you can't resist a bird with a broken wing. Really, I have a son who struggled with some of this stuff. And I'm a mom. I'm, I feel very empathic towards boys. And I think hopefully that was clear in some of the stuff I said earlier about the way that boys are treated in society from a young age. And I'm concerned. But I really think that it's possible. I think a lot of women and men want the same thing. And no matter what you want, there's someone of the opposite sex who wants the same thing. And whether, regardless of how good looking you are, there's someone who you will probably find attractive enough who wants the same thing and who will find you attractive. So I think it's a very solvable puzzle, but it's that problem where people are in the corners in the ring and not venturing toward each other and, and risking rejection. So moving to the women's side of the equation, because I, I think it really helps guys to understand better women as well. And we talk about female psychology and, and stuff like that, because a lot of the assumptions guys make about women are often wrong, I think. So what kind of decisions do you feel like the women are the strategic decisions they're making and maybe getting wrong today? Give some insights to the guys about that, how it affects them. Certainly for the young guys, they're probably really, really frustrated by, say, on their college campus or when they get out of school, the guys who seem to be cleaning up are these douchebags who, and they never seem to be lacking for women. So there's no question that immaturity or being really young, whether it's high school or starting out in college, both guys and girls are kind of lusting after often lusting after the wrong people, people they really probably don't have a chance of getting with for what they want, whether it's something casual in the guy's case or something more committed in the girl's case. And they may be too trusting and naive, so they get taken advantage of by someone. They're providing some benefit with nothing in return. So in the case of women, a lot of times they will have, I would say most women get burned by a cad once or twice. I think very few women who are out there you're trying to interact with men, don't get deceived in some way somewhere along the line and put out more than they meant to based on what they thought they were getting in return. So yes, you know, and then guys say, well, why should I take sloppy seconds when I'm 25 and now I'm attractive and I've got an established career? Well, you can look at it that way, but I think guys are making kind of stupid mistakes too. We're all just sort of stumbling along trying to figure it out. And so I think focusing on why didn't you like me before I was attractive is not necessarily a really good question to be asking because some people, both guys and girls, are late bloomers and they have more kind of um, currency in the sexual marketplace as they get older and more established. So, so, and the other thing, you know, so I think the girls mostly, the problems arise when they are deluding themselves about how much the guy likes them. They don't want to be forward and ask him. I always say, if you have to say, Susan, does he like me? If you're even writing that in an email to me, my answer is not enough. He might like having sex with you. He might like you, but not want a relationship. But if you're wondering, I don't know if he likes me, you're hoping for something that he's not delivering. So the answer is no, move on. I've never or rarely heard of good relationships that came out of situations where the woman felt insecure and relationships come out of them, but they don't end very well. They don't progress very well. So I think um, for the guys, I would say it's important to demonstrate interest and to do so confidently. You see those guys say like, here, put your, we should hang out, put your number in my phone. So there's a level of a little bit of a cockiness kind of confidence thing going on there. Women respond well to that, but they still want to know that the guy is a good guy because they don't want to be in a situation that's dangerous to them physically or emotionally. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Some guys, when they learn about the power of confidence, that women are attracted to that, your example, your number in my phone, I think they go to the extreme where they put everything in that box and they're just like, everything I do has to be confident. And, and it comes off as cold sometimes as well. So then you're avoiding the other side of the equation, which you're talking about is come across as someone she can relate to and talk to. Right. Well, I think that's why it is really important to practice, right? It's important to practice and get a sense of yourself and work on that self-development piece so that you do feel good about who you are. You do feel good about having a conversation about an esoteric topic that might interest you, or you feel comfortable asking a woman to hang out as friends and like not necessarily saying it's going to be sex on the third date or she's history, you know, sort of letting things happen more organically. People can't let things happen organically if they don't feel comfortable with who they are because it requires a certain amount of trust that if I'm conducting myself with good character and good intentions and I appear to be receiving the same from the other person, good things will happen. So anxiety destroys that, right? 
uh, how is this going? How am I being perceived? What is she going to say? So I think sometimes, like, that's why I said, instead of thinking, like, I want to get laid three times this semester or I want to lose my virginity this winter, it's a lot more useful, though, requires a sort of delay of gratification to do the kind of work where maybe you can you can have a comfortable conversation that feels natural to the girl sitting next to you in class at the very end of the school year. But then that could be a big first for a guy. What would be some win-win situations in college at the moment for guys and women? I can think of a couple off my head, which might be ways of kind of taking the environment you've described and making the most of it. So for example, if I'm a guy who's a senior, but he hasn't been doing as well in his freshman year and so on, he wasn't hooking up with girls then if he now pursues some some girls that are fresh just come in then he could potentially have a relationship with one of those girls because she's in that position you were saying she just come in she's a little bit naive she's open kind of to the possibilities i think it's also like it's kind of like when you travel you're more open to experience right you've just arrived on campus you're in a new place everything's new i'm free i'm gonna enjoy myself and so you can take advantage of that to find someone interesting and potentially start a relationship with that dynamic Absolutely. And I think that's a really good point, actually. You know, freshman guys have it the worst, senior guys have it the best. So there's some, definitely, but you can't, that senior guy, this requires effort. You can't just be a senior in college and look across the cafeteria, right? The guys need to approach. And the thing about these parties where everybody's drinking is that that approach, you, all you have to do is turn to your right or turn to your left, and people are drunk. So for the guy who is frustrated because he isn't doing as well, and now he's a senior and the freshman girls have come in, he's not in a fraternity, so he's not even going to be invited to those parties. So he has to have inserted himself into some activities or some laws or some, some campus life where he is going to be coming into and classes is one thing, study groups work. Being in the library, I can remember meeting guys in the library who sit next to me and you wind up saying, like, do you want a piece of gum or whatever it might be? But I think guys have to get comfortable sort of putting it out there and making the approach. Because even with everything that's happened in our society, the vast majority of women still want the guys to take the initiative. Absolutely. I just wanted to reassert the the point you've made there is that um, guys, if you don't have access to the fraternity, it's not everything. You can step out and you can make things work outside of it. Because we've actually come across that uh, quite a few times before where they're like, well, I'm on a fraternity. I can't do anything about it. I don't have access to the parties and and all this stuff. And it could be for different reasons. Sometimes it's because of money reasons they can't afford to uh, get involved in all that stuff as well. So it could be for a variety of reasons. And there's plenty of other approaches, like you said, for activities, for just talking to people around the campus as you meet them, the coffee shops. The library is a great place. I met lots of people in the libraries when I was at school. There are other options and you just have to realize that before you can go out and and start taking those opportunities. And the other thing I would say, Angel, that I think is really important, that guy, that senior guy who says, I'm not in a fraternity and I'm not going to have, he has to realize that aside from the women who have just come in and want to explore the campus, there are a lot of regulars, women who are regulars at these fraternity parties, and they are going to gravitate toward the familiar fraternity faces they see at these parties, not look for the new guy who's just come in from his engineering program or whatever. But there are plenty of women like him who say, I'm not in a sorority. I don't really feel comfortable at these parties where everyone is getting blind drunk. I don't like alcohol. I don't like to drink. You know, a lot of women don't enjoy the sensation and they feel like outliers and like they have nowhere to socialize. But all of these campuses are literally hundreds of organizations, whether it be political, arts, there's all kinds of things that people can do and meet people. So I think your odds of getting a good relationship are not that great, even if you do have access to the fraternities. You're much better focusing on women who appear to be similar to you in your orientation, because not all women are equally oriented towards casual stuff. Women have very different kinds of relationship goals, even you know, intersexually. So look for someone similar to yourself. There's a lot of evidence that people pair off that way for dating, for marriage, even for sex. You know, most people having a lot of casual sex are having sex with other people having a fair amount of casual sex. You don't see a lot of players deflowering virgins, despite what you might hear, you know, and despite that element of the freshman girls coming in being naive, it does happen. But mostly people are gravitating towards those similar to themselves. So I think I would say to the guys, like, look for, who are your people? Who are your women that where you not only feel you have something in common, Yes, you find them attractive, but you also are going to be attractive to them. Yeah, and brought this up earlier for the women is that they're often 
basically after these top 10% guys or whatever who aren't potentially, they aren't in the most cases interested in relationships and the girls can't figure out. I think the same thing often happens to the guys. They're looking at some of what they see as the hottest girls, the coolest girls, and they're hoping for a relationship. And they don't realize that those girls are basically off the market for relationships. They're not maybe interested in that. It's not, or, and it's not so much they're not interested in it, but maybe it's just the dynamic of the fraternity and everything that's going on on campus. They're not going to be really open to that kind of relationship easily. In a way, you're looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place. That's why I said when people are immature, both guys and girls, they spend some time stumbling along and making some bad choices. I've talked to so many young guys who really are lusting after the hottest girl on campus who's in a best sorority and how can I meet her? Well, even if you meet her, no, it's not going to happen because she's hooking up on and off with this guy who's in a very similar social situation to her. And she's mad because he cheated with her, but then she got back and she had a one night stand with someone else to get back at him. And these people are behaving in a way that's similar with one another. And she would be a terrible girlfriend to this nice kid who wants like something real. Right, right. He's looking for something very, very different. He might want a much calmer lifestyle, maybe he's serious about study or whatever. He's not interested in all the parties and everything. So you've got to kind of realize that you can't take a, a girl from the party environment and expect her to change. Just as in, in every other area of life, you kind of look at what's going on. So to round off, what are the best ways for people to connect with you and learn more about you and your work? Well, my main presence is my blog, HuggingUpSmart.com. I write a couple of posts a week. People should realize, though, I'm not a traditional dating coach. I do give advice, and people often ask for advice. And not only I, but other readers will chime in. As you mentioned, we do have a pretty active comment section. It's not unusual for a young guy to come and say, hey, to the women here, how should I interpret this signal I got? Or like she was wanted to cuddle and kiss, but then she said she didn't want anything more than that. Like, what is that? Why, why would a girl even do that? And then sometimes, you know, so they wind up advising each other sometimes, which is nice because they're in an age group with one another and that I don't see that firsthand day to day. But the thing I was going to say is, aside from giving advice, because of my own background and my own interests, I do a lot of writing about research about sex mating. I do a lot of sociology, a lot of psychology, evolutionary psychology. I get into evolutionary stuff a lot. I'm very interested in sort of the academic or intellectual questions about why people choose each other and how they choose each other. And so a lot of my posts are not so much do this, but like we were talking about pluralistic ignorance or the principle of least interest. Like here's how you need to understand the marketplace you're operating in. People think most people are hooking up, but in fact, most people are not hooking up. Or people think, I just need to pretend to care least, but maybe you want to consider being the person who says, I like So to. on the principle of least interest, because you, you brought it up earlier, is that a term that's been outlined in uh, scientific papers a lot? From which pool of research? Is it evolutionary psychology or where is it coming from? Well, actually, the principle of least interest goes way back. I want to say that the phrase was coined sometime like in the 40s. It's a principle in psychology that goes back a ways it doesn't necessarily apply. It just applies to anything in a negotiation, right? If the car salesman really needs to make a quota this month, you're in the driver's seat, literally. But so, but it applies to mating and it has been, I have all kinds of searches I do for the research, the academic research, anything, but yes, it's usually coming out of the field of sociology, psychology, or evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology. So those are the big areas where a lot of this stuff gets done. And usually the research subjects are college students because they have access to the academics and easy access to them. And that happens to suit my purposes very well, since that's the group that I often write about. There is a lot of uh, research on that, the pluralistic ignorance, sociosexuality, which is the idea that some people are just wired to prefer short-term things. They're necessarily looking ever for like a monogamous lifetime partner, other people say like, oh my God, I just want one person to be in love with. While there's a big difference between men and women, there's actually a much bigger difference within each sex. So there's a huge difference between women who really like casual and women who would never have casual sex. And there's a pretty big difference on the male side as well. And so that's why I said, I think it's really great for people to try to identify those who have similar outlooks, similar values. The guy who wants a girlfriend is not going to be happy with the girl who hooks up on the regular and vice versa. And she's not going to be happy with him. So those kinds of values and the way people feel about relationships and when they're comfortable having sex and whether they'd be willing to cheat on someone or poach a friend's girlfriend, these kinds of attitudinal things, they're measuring attitudes. So it's not like you could say, yes, I did this and I did that. But I think there is some value in these surveys 
at least captures sort of the zeitgeist of what a generation is thinking and how most people within that generation express their interests and desires. Right, and it's capturing the culture of the moment, like what's seen as the correct way to view things right now, uh, which is an important input to understand. Who besides yourself would you recommend for high quality advice in this area? Is there anyone you've come across, like maybe it's books or like presentations or you know, is there anyone you respect and follow their research or their work? That's a really good question. There are some sites that I tend to like a lot, but the, again, they're not so much in the dating advice category. Yeah. For example, there's um, a site called the Science of Relationships that does a lot of work about relationship and talks about a lot of the research. There are people like um, Eric Barker, who has, uh, he now has an article in Time Magazine as well. He sums up a lot of how can you be more appealing to the opposite sex? And then he'll have 10 studies and 10 bullet points that go with them. So he's kind of a science-based guy as well. There's another woman named Duana Welch who has a website that's very good. She's guest posted for me a few times. And she also tends to be analytical and data-driven. Um, I'm really not about the anecdotal evidence. I really hesitate to give advice to people based on I've heard girls say this or guys say that. I really do like to, especially since I'm not in there, living in there, that culture with them day to day, I'm more data oriented. That's very strange of a strategy consultant. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> <laughs> There are some great sites uh, for guys, like the Art of Masculinity is, uh, or the Art of Manliness, excuse me, is a great site. It's about all kinds of things, you know, it might be like how to, all kinds of things, but it's it's talking about masculinity. And I think it's a hugely popular site. He started around the same time I did, and now he's getting 5 million people a month. So he's really, really successful. Brett McKay is his name. And he talks about all different kinds of, of aspects of manliness throughout history and today, the way to break up with someone, doing things in a way that you feel good about your character. So I think I really, really like his website. And he's clearly struck a nerve with, with the male populace because his leadership is about almost entirely male. As you said earlier, it's, uh, masculinity is in flux. So I think we need to redefine it. And guys are searching for what that's going to be. We don't have a culture of it. I think we have guys who are defining it for themselves. There's no clear culture, whereas in the past we had a clear culture, you know, of what the expectations were for, for men and, and how to be masculine and so on. So it's going to be interesting how it works out. Hopefully it will steer it in a really positive direction. <laughs> we'll see. Yes, good luck with that, because I do think men, women need support too, but I think men really need support and they need role models. And fathers should, and I think often do that, but... Like I said, my generation was on the was pioneers in this sort of realm of casual, no strings sex. And so this is really not a very old development. And people are still trying to figure out how it works and how to make it work and learning that it doesn't work. On the work. subject of, of, of masculinity, there's a couple of guys I kind of learned some stuff from and I thought it was really interesting is uh, Jack Donovan. He writes some books. Some of it's a bit hard to read and, and stuff that you might have heard of it uh, for some people, but it's a bit more extreme. But, you know, I think he's got some great material. And there's also David Dieta who's got the masculine feminine polarity, uh, which has some really interesting stuff. And then interesting, they come from very different worlds. That's what I love about this whole thing is that there's so much information out there on dating, sex and relationships. It's coming from academia. It's coming from spirituality. It's coming, you know, it's coming from all, all the sides at the moment. And it's kind of trying to find a common consensus. And, and that's kind of what we do here. And I just find it interesting that sometimes the idea is like they fit perfectly. They come from complete different extremes of societies where they originated, but they're actually kind of based on the same ideas gives us some comfort that all does make sense. Eventually there is a truth. Yeah. And I think, I think for me, the one thing that I really like finding is writers who acknowledge the biological sex differences or maybe even the cultural sex differences. But I think it's really important to be honest that women do, you know, we may want egalitarian relationships, but we still do want a man who feels comfortable dominating. We want that confidence, even though we're actually seeking a provider we still want a man who we know can access resources as needed. So these traits have evolved, and I don't believe that we can say that men or women have evolved badly. I mean, it is what it is. It's the best homo sap has survived so far. And I think what we need to do is accept the traits of the opposite sex and learn to work within that and, and do that meeting in the middle that used to be easier and isn't as easy anymore. Absolutely. That's a really good takeaway. Face reality. And, you know, and work with it rather than trying to ignore it, which is what a lot of people do. Right? <laughs> yes. Or that you just avoid it. This is a question we ask everyone. What are your top three recommendations to guys who are starting from scratch? They got no previous knowledge or anything, and they just want to improve their dating life as fast as possible. I think get out there, have some, you, you got to build a thick skin. 
so many guys come to my site and they want women to change. They want women to indicate interest more. Or why will women ask me out? I want women to ask me out. Don't spend your time that way. You're going to have to do it. You're going to have to make it happen. If you're not good at it, do it a thousand times until you feel better at it. I'm a big believer in eye contact. And and I, I'm also like a friendly person. I meet a lot of people as I go about my daily business. At my age, I don't have anything. I don't want anything from them. I'm not invested. But I could easily strike up a conversation with a handsome guy at the dry cleaners or a young mom at the Starbucks or whatever. And I think young people need to learn. They need need to hone those skills. And one of the first things is eye contact. Just go through your daily life and make eye contact with as many people as you can, and then add a smile to that eye contact. And you know, three seconds is the threshold for sexual attraction and eye contact. If someone holds eye contact with you for three seconds, it's a signal of sexual attraction. So start with eye contact, add the smile, then you see someone you think is really attractive, hold eye contact for three seconds. Maybe they like wink or smile back and then they leave and you never see them again, right? This is not going to lead to you getting what you want today. But these are the kinds of skills. I mean, basically what I'm describing, Angel, is cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's like self-development. It's like I have some anxiety. How do I overcome it? By doing this many, many times. I don't have the skills. How do I get better at it? How do people get to be piano prodigies? They practice for 10,000 hours. It's not that different in dating. So it can feel false. It can feel forced. But you do learn. And you learn from your mistakes. And you get more comfortable with who you are. And like when someone's starting a business, they have to have an elevator pitch. Here's what my company is. If they don't have that, they're not going to get funding. If a guy doesn't have an elevator pitch that's genuine about who he is and what he enjoys, he's not going to get anywhere. So that's why I think... You know, inner game is key. It's a lot more work. It takes a lot longer. You know, some of these guys are undoing a lifetime of kind of um, misdirection in terms of what they've believed or what they've been taught or what have you. They can't just read a book and get it and go out and be like, you know, lady killer. They're going to have to experiment with what works and practice those kinds of activities and skills. And I say the same thing to women, by the way. Go out there, just walk up to a guy in a bookstore and say, did you read that book? You know, I loved that book or whatever it might be. That's a really good point. And it really fits well with, I think one of the biggest problems is like people just don't take action. They'll listen to these podcasts. Thanks guys. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, But they won't take anything away and do anything about it. So that's the really most important thing I always see. Like you say, to get out there, just start doing something and fail a whole bunch of times, but don't take it seriously. And but because that practice will just just build up, like Susan's saying, it's it's, it's hyper important. You're not going to get anywhere without any experience. And you know what, I'll tell I'll close with one anecdote, which is that when I um, was getting before I got together with my husband, we started out kind of casually. And so then I really liked him. I liked him before we were looking up. I approached him and I said, um, you know, I really like you. And I would really like to spend more time with you. And he kind of <laughs> kicked his toe in the dirt and like cleared his throat and said, I, um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. That's just a really nice, nice intro story. Uh, 30 years of marriage. And, congratulations. You know, it's, it's an yes, achievement. So he came around. He came around like within the next few months. But I was devastated. I was really disappointed. I, I was basically head over heels for him already. Well, here's what I want to share. That happened, and I was devastated, and I sort of ran back to my apartment and cried. But there was a part of me that felt really good, a little bit relieved, but even a little bit successful. I was proud of myself for putting it out there. And I thought, now I know the truth. He doesn't feel the same way. I'm going to move on with my life, but I'm not going to sit around and mope and wonder, and why is he talking to me at this party? It felt empowering. That's an overused word, but I felt so much better taking action and failing than remaining passive. No, absolutely. That's a really a diehard rule, but it's very prevalent, not just in, this is we're giving dating advice here, but it's prevalent in society. Like if you listen to startup, the top startup guys, the VCs and everyone, they say, you're going to fail a hundred times in business. You just got to get in there and you got to start in it and you got to start learning. So everyone's saying it's not just in this dating sphere or what the point I want to get across is like this is everywhere in life. So it's nothing different, nothing weird, nothing abnormal. This is just how life is. You have to get out there. You have to start trying. You have to fail a lot and, and learn from those experiences. And the failure is often not personal. You know, you don't know what go- is going on in that person's life. A lot of times when women shoot guys down or they don't want to be approached, they haven't even gotten to the point where they're evaluating the guy as some kind of candidate. 
It's like, I'm not here for that today. My head's in another place today. I'm not looking to chit chat with a single guy, even if I'm single and I'm looking for a guy or even if he's a cute guy. So I think guys really need to understand that these rejections, now the woman who offers the nuclear rejection, obviously there are some bad people out there of both sexes, but perfectly nice woman might say, thank you, but I'm not interested. That does not say anything about who he is or even how attractive he is. So I think guys really need to disassociate the sort of personal experience feeling of rejection when they're approaching women they don't even really know very well, because it's so often not about them. Great. Thank you, Susan, so much for your time today and all the uh, information. It's been really helpful. Thank you, Angela. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Take control of your dating life today. Take one idea or one insight from today's episode and apply it today. Don't wait, do it today. That's all it takes to change your life, step by step, episode by episode. Learn more about what I, Angel Donovan, and my team do at datingskillsreview.com. How we help men like you take control of their dating lives.